Today's lecture will focus upon the counterculture movement of the 1960s, and we'll get beyond the 1960s as well into some later decades. Uh, but if you look at that word counter, counter means to be in opposition to, uh, to be against, to seek to change. And so uh, there's quite a few groups I'm going to mention in this lecture. Uh, I'm going to be talking about groups who are just seeking to withdraw from American society to try to completely reject it. Uh, but also groups that were trying to change it, groups that were seeking greater quality, greater opportunity, and so therefore were hoping to change mainstream American culture and uh, receive greater opportunity as a consequence of those changes. So there'll be a lot of different things mentioned in this lecture, and these lectures are longer than I would like them to be, but that's because I'm not meeting with all of you on a daily basis, and so I feel like I need to explain a lot of things in these lectures so you at least get some explanation from me uh, concerning this material. Uh, and so I pulled from a lot of different sections. I pulled from Digital Tech section 14.3 and then 15.4, 15.5, and 15.6. And I highly recommend that you read those sections to develop a further understanding of this material. Okay, so counterculture. Your text defines counterculture as a movement made up mostly of white, middle class, college youth, who had grown disillusioned with the war in Vietnam and injustices in America in the 1960s. So to be disillusioned is to be disappointed. Uh, so these are uh, people who are disappointed with some aspects of uh, mainstream America in this time period, uh, particularly war and racism. And so they are rejecting it. Uh, and they are, they are preaching a message of peace and love. They're preaching a message of peace and love and trying to adhere to that message. And if you look at that word peace, peace, there's an element of protest in that, right? If you think of peace as opposite of war. So protest will definitely be part of the counterculture movement. Now, a common phrase in the counterculture movement, a phrase that the hippies use quite a bit. Now, the hippies were a group that just seek to reject mainstream America and exist without it uh, as much as possible. But a common phrase of this movement was tune in, turn on, and drop out. Uh, and so the hippies and other members of the counterculture movement believed in nonconformity. And this phrase, tune in, turn on, drop out, was a phrase uh, created by or quoted by uh, Timothy Leary, uh, Timothy Leary is a Harvard psychology professor, a philosopher, and uh, he did, while he was professor at Harvard, he did some experimentation in uh, mind-altering drugs, hallucinogenic drugs, uh, while he was there, and this will eventually lead to his dismissal, because it will be seen as too controversial, and there were rumors that he may have been giving some of these drugs to his students, so eventually he will be let go by the university, but he is kind of seen as one of the founders or perhaps the leaders of the counterculture movement. Now, the counterculture movement is against the materialism, uh, once again, against the materialism and war of modern American society. Uh, once again, they felt that uh, American society had become too focused upon these things, too focused upon materialism, too focused upon technology, and particularly too focused upon war. And so, therefore, they were rejecting it. And this movement will attract tens of thousands of idealistic young people who will literally leave school, leave work, leave home uh, to create communities of peace, love, and harmony, or at least attempt to create those communities. And a lot of these communities will become known as urban communes, and the most famous one of these is mentioned in your textbook in the beginning of section 14.3, uh, the Haight-Ashbury District of San Francisco. Um, which I'll mention some more about later in the lecture. Okay, so what I've done here is a comparison of two different generations. Now, if you take my college course, you'll see this slide again because I use it in there as well. Uh, but what I've done is a comparison of generations. So what I've done is I've got the World War II generation here and the baby boom generation here. The World War II generation were their parents, right? Remember, those World War II veterans came home from World War II and they wanted to raise a family, and fertility rates had greatly increased, and the, and the economy was booming. And so we see the largest generation in United States history, uh, the baby boom generation. My parents, uh, your grandparents, 
Although I don't believe that my parents were ever hippies, uh, at least they haven't told me so. Um, anyway, uh, fashion. Um, if you look at the fashion of the 50s, right, very conformist decade, three-piece suit, right, the proper look, right, at least for males. You had to wear a tie, you had to have a tie, button shirt, uh, suit jacket. Uh, the counterculture generation, the baby boom generation, they're into jeans and tie-dyed shirts. Definitely a more loose look. A tie-dyed shirt, hopefully you're aware, is you know a multicolored shirt that's been bleached quite a bit, I believe. Um, crew cut was the style of the World War II generation. Short hair, right? Buzz cut. Uh, the counterculture generation, they're going to grow their hair long. They're going to refuse to get a haircut and you know, long hair is in. Um, the World War II generation very much believed in monogamy, monogamous relationships, and their definition of that is going to be narrow. A monogamous relationship in which a man meets a woman, they fall in love, and they stay married and stay married forever. The counterculture generation is going to be more about free love. They see monogamous relationships as too stifling. Uh, multiple partners is okay, according to their uh, definition of things. Uh, drugs are part of each generation. If you view alcohol as a drug, and technically it is, uh, if you look at the 50s, alcohol was a drug of choice. Um, I don't know if you watched any shows set in the 50s time period, but when you watch those, it may surprise you how much you see these people drinking. I mean, drinking um, basically hard liquor, whether it be a scotch or whiskey or what have you, and they're drinking in business meetings in the middle of the day. And it was actually quite a common thing to do, uh, surprisingly. Um, during the counterculture, the 60s, uh, illegal drugs will be common. And the two drugs that will be experimented the most will be marijuana and LSD. Uh, LSD is a hallucinogenic drug, meaning uh, those who take it experience hallucinations or see things that aren't there. Now, when you talk about the counterculture movement, the event that came to symbolize this movement can be seen as Woodstock. Now, Woodstock is maybe, or one of the, greatest rock and roll concerts in the United States history. It took place in 1969. It took place upstate in New York, uh, literally on a farm, a farm with a very large hill. Uh, it's, it's, viewed as, it's viewed as three days of peace and music. Um, it really is an extraordinary event. I mean, there are things there going on that shouldn't have been, illegal drug use and things like that. Uh, but it's really extraordinary how peaceful it was. Uh, there were a couple tragic deaths. There was one overdose. Uh, and there was a teenager who was accidentally ran over by a tractor. Uh, the place had turned into a mud pit, and the guy just didn't see the poor kid. Uh, but uh, it, it, the reason why I say it's an extraordinary event is because the bands who played, and so many people played, and the lack of violence that occurred. So it did kind of stick to its message of peace and love. Uh, definitely an element of protest, too. A lot of the songs there were anti-Vietnam War songs. Um, but extraordinary acts, and I don't know if you know rock and roll history like I do. Rock and roll is my favorite form of music, but maybe some of these names are recognizable to you. Jimi Hendrix, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, The Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, The Who, and others that I'm not mentioning here. Uh, three days, uh, several uh, acts that continue to influence music well beyond this decade, uh, continue to influence bands today. Uh, makes this an extraordinary concert. And what we see here is kind of a natural connection between rock and roll and counterculture because rock and roll as a, as a musical form has always had an aspect of rebellion, maybe protest to it. So the two kind of naturally go together. Rock and roll is also a very di diverse musical art form. Uh, it pulls from several different areas of uh, American music, whether it be jazz or blues or rhythm and blues or folk or country even. So it pulls from all these different areas to kind of make a unique and diverse diverse sound. And so there's a natural attraction there because one of the, one of the aspects of the counterculture movement is diversity, uh, accepting of peoples, uh, different peoples. And uh, rock and roll is a very diverse musical form. So because of its rebellion and that diversity, there's kind of a natural connection there. Now, I want to mention a band, a rock and roll band, that did not appear at Woodstock, but is arguably the most popular rock band of the era, and that's the Beatles. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning the Beatles is because you can kind of see the influence of the counterculture upon this band. Now, the Beatles, uh, often known as the Fab Four, right? John Lennon, Paul McCartney, 
uh, uh, George Harrison and Ringo Starr. Uh, there are four youths who come from Liverpool, England. Uh, they arrive in America in 1964. Sadly, they broke up six years later, although they all had long music careers. Um, and if you look at their early hits, pretty you know basic songs about love, right? She loves you, or I want to hold your hand. Later on, we see songs like this, like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And if you look, there's three letters here that are kind of interesting. L, S, D, right? And if you look at these two images, we can definitely see an influence of the counterculture upon the Beatles and their music, or maybe they're influencing the counterculture with their music and their fashion, as you see these two influences here. Now, just a little bit more about the Beatles, pretty significant band in United States history. Uh, two of them are still alive and still making music. Uh, you've got Paul McCartney here, right, and Ringo Starr here, or here and here. And they are in their late 70s, and they both still make music. Paul McCartney just released an album recently. Uh, sadly, uh, George Harrison, uh, pictured uh, here and here, passed away in 2001 at the age of 61 due to cancer, and John Lennon was assassinated. John Lennon was assassinated. He was assassinated in 1980 by a deranged fan who had become a, a Christian, but a radical Christian guy. He's kind of extreme in his beliefs and was upset that John Lennon made the song Imagine because within that song he says, Imagine there's no heaven. And he was quoted in an interview as saying the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. He was kind of joking there, but this man by the name of Mark David Chapman took him literally, I guess, and you know, decided to shoot him. And we lost a great performing artist, one of the greatest ever, arguably, on, uh, let's, on, uh, in 1980. So, uh, December 8th, 1980. So, sad day. Uh, a little bit more about the counterculture here. Um, so once again, songs, images, and actions of the counterculture movement had elements of Vietnam protests. A lot of the songs the artists were singing at the time would be anti-war songs. Uh, a lot of the gatherings, of course, are anti-war. And they also challenged uh, traditional morals. Um, and, if, and the protests would often target Vietnam involvement in the draft. And if you look, here's another comparison, right? So here's that World War II generation, typical propaganda of the time period, man the guns, join the Navy. And now we look at the baby boom generation, the counterculture generation. We've got girls say yes to boys who say no, right? So there's two things going on in this image here. They're challenging traditional morals, right? Girls say yes to boys who say no. Now, what are they encouraging the boys to say no to? The draft, which was a key source of protest in this time period. So once again, we kind of see the changes, the different perspectives going on, the rejection of mainstream America at least some aspects of it going on here. Okay, now, uh, this movement does not last. Um, it declines actually rather quickly. Uh, in, in the early 70s, it starts to decline. Even by the mid-70s, still some elements of it left. Uh, and there's some reasons for that. These urban communes uh, that the hippies had glorified, and there were, were some things to glorify about them, that's for sure. Some of the messages and peace and love and things about that. But they turn dangerous. And why do they turn dangerous? Because often drugs lead to bad things. Uh, people abuse drugs. Experimentation with so-called minor drugs can lead to experimentation with more serious drugs, such as heroin and other opiates. And that could lead to some pretty serious addiction and death. And, and it can also lead to crime. And so, therefore, some of these communities became dangerous as crime and drugs often go hand in hand. And what's happening is many are becoming dependent upon the society they had rejected. As poverty incurs, they find themselves, you know, collecting welfare, food stamps. Uh, even at Woodstock, as you're trying to reject American society, you're still using some of the technology, right? You need the what? You need the the, the instruments plugged into amps and lights and sound. So uh, basically, it's 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 hard to maintain a lifestyle like this permanently. And so what happens is basically, uh, in some respect, these people grow up, right? And they move on. So they go back to school, they get jobs, and they move on uh, with their lives. Um, so let's look at the legacy of the movement. Um, there are definitely some positives and negatives to this movement. If, if we were having class right now, we would have a class debate about the positive and negatives of this movement. That went very well last year. Uh, but anyway, um, so legacy of movement. So if we look at some key things, 
we see a more casual and permissive attitude towards subjects that have once been prohibited. And some of that can be good, of course, uh, talking about things that sometimes people don't um, want to deal with, whether it be sexual behavior or other issues that can be taboo. Um, we see liberal attitudes towards art, dress, music, and lifestyle, more open-mindedness, less conformity, less rejection of certain forms of art. Um, uh, we see an open-minded attitude towards people of other cultures. Um, you know, this group was very anti-racism, very anti-sexism, very anti-homophobia, uh, things like that. Um, so uh, an open-mindedness. So I think a very positive legacy of this movement is an open-mindedness to people of different cultures and a better understanding of people of different cultures. Um, now there will be a conservative reaction to this by those who feared loss of traditional values uh, or moral decay. And there are definitely some negative consequences of this movement that I think one has to take into account, um, whether it be you know experimenting with uh, illegal drugs or open sexuality, there are some negative consequences to this. Uh, permissiveness in these things can lead to drug addiction, uh, irresponsible sex can lead to disease and death. So there are some things in this movement that I think uh, deserve to be glorified and there are some things that definitely should be avoided uh, when you um, take a look at it. And the cons part of the conservative reaction was due to some of those things that should be avoided. Some of that conservative reaction is also um, prejudicial too. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that in a later lecture. Okay, moving on, I want to remind you of some of this. Well, I like to do this in lectures, of course, bring up some things we've talked about in the past. So I want to remind you that out of this counterculture movement was, uh, was, a, was a growing political movement known as the New Left. This can, this can again be defined as a growing youth movement of the 1960s. Uh, the New Left was demanding sweeping changes in uh, American society. Uh, they were re rejecting, or they were seen as rejecting communism and socialism, but they did want to make great change. Two groups that I mentioned before are the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, and then the FSM, which is the free speech movement. The FS, or the SDS, I'm sorry, had been founded by Tom Hayden and Al Haber. Uh, they believed that corporations and large government institutions had taken over America. And they're very concerned with equality, very concerned with economic justice, and very concerned with peace. So they became a group that led Vietnam protests across the country as they were angry at the destruction they believed their country and military were causing. Okay, this group will sponsor the 1965 anti-war march on Washington, which 20,000 people participated in. The FSM, another group I mentioned in the previous chapter, uh, free speech movement, they'll begin at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, they grew out of a dispute between administrators and students concerning free speech on campus. They focused their criticism upon powerful businesses and government uh, institutions. And what these groups want is individual freedom, participatory democracy, as much voting as possible, as much participation in government uh, by its citizens as possible, uh, in their eyes, a true democracy. Okay, I mentioned that I would discuss several different groups who were seeking to change mainstream America in order to acquire greater equality, greater opportunity within it. And these are groups that are inspired by the African American Civil Rights Movement. And so I want to start with Hispanic Americans uh, and Hispanic equality. Now, if we look at the 1960s, we see a growth in Hispanic American population. Um, from 3 million to more than 9 million within the United States. You may remember that in 1964, uh, President Johnson passed an Immigration Act that did away with uh, several quotas and did away with restrictions on immigration based on race, basically trying to eliminate racism from immigration. And so what we'll see is an influx of uh, diversity in the United States and uh, continuing to add to the, the, the the greatness of diversity that exists in the United States of America and, and the valuable contributions that occur as a result of it. What we'll see is many more immigrants from Mexico, Puerto Rico really are immigrants because that's a territory, but more of them will move to the mainland United States, uh, Cuba. A lot of Cubans were fleeing Fidel Castro's Cuba, you may remember, uh, the Dominican Republic, and then from Central and South America. 
And so we'll see a greater influx of immigration from uh, um, Hispanic um, Latin American countries. Now, Mexican Americans are the largest group. And if you think about it, that makes sense because I think Americans forget this, but we took over half of Mexico in 1848 when we uh, won the Mexican-American War, and many of those Mexicans were already here. <laughs> so um, Mexican-Americans are the largest group. I think sometimes uh, Americans forget that when they're repressing or being prejudicial towards uh, Mexicans within the United States, is that many of them were already here because we took over half their country. Uh, and you may remember during World War II, several Mexicans were also recruited to come work in the United States as a part of the Brazero program uh, due to labor shortages that we experienced. And many of them, despite efforts to move them back out of the country, will end up staying within the country. Uh, many will serve in World War II. So a uh, very um, strong presence of Mexican-Americans in the United States. Um, a leader of the uh, Mexican-American and the Hispanic equality movement will be uh, Cesar Chavez. Now, Cesar Chavez uh, is an extraordinary uh, individual. Um, I guess a good way to think of him is, if you want a comparison, is perhaps as the Hispanic Martin Luther King. Um, and he'll become the leader of the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, which will, be a, which will become a, a farm workers union. Uh, Chavez will represent uh, Mexican-Americans, uh, primarily the largest Latino group, that live mostly in the Southwest and California. This group includes, once again, uh, descendants of the territory ceded to the U.S. by Mexico uh, after the Mexican-American War, um, but also descendants of the Bracero Program, or at the time, recent immigrants uh, in the 1960s seeking better paying jobs. And uh, the primary source of employment for these people, as I'm sure you know, is migrant farm work. It's why they're quite frankly recruited to come to the United States because they'll do this backbreaking work, which is incredibly hard work that contributes to our diets and our food, incredibly valuable work. But they'll do it uh, typically for low wages, and it's very hard work on a daily basis. Uh, and you can imagine that if you're laboring in this situation, uh, you want your circumstances to improve, particularly if you're a Mexican-American citizen who's supposed to be protected by the Constitution. So uh, Cesar will use nonviolent strategies to gain bargaining rights for these farm workers um, uh, of, of California's large fruit and vegetable companies. Uh, in 1965, when California's grape growers refused to recognize the union, Chavez launched a nationwide boycott of the company's grapes. Uh, representatives of the union will travel the country to promote the boycott. Uh, Chavez will go on a hunger strike to promote the boycott. He will eat very little for 25 days, I believe. He'll meet with Robert Kennedy during that hunger strike. Uh, and eventually the union will be recognized and benefits will increase, pay will increase. And this movement will, expire, will inspire other Hispanic civil rights movements. Now, there is much more of the Hispanic civil rights movement than what I'm giving you in this lecture, but you are going to have an assignment on this, so you'll be reading some of those things. And as I mentioned, this lecture has a lot of material on it, uh, so I can't detail things as much as I would like. But Cesar Chavez is very much a disciple of Gandhi, a disciple of King, in practicing nonviolent protests to help his people gain a better life for themselves. And... And the more you read about him, the more you're impressed about him. Uh, just an extraordinary individual. Uh, next group I want to focus upon is uh, Native Americans. Now, as I'm sure you know, if you have even casual interest in American history, uh, Native Americans have been the poorest of Americans, perhaps the most uh, discriminated against, the most abused by uh, genocidal takeover of their country than any of any minority group in the United States history, which is saying a lot due to African slavery, but... Uh, Native Americans have been the poorest of Americans with the highest employment rate, and that continues even now. Now, in 1954, President Eisenhower approved a policy known as the Termination Policy. And what he was attempting to do here was to uh, basically end the reservation system to a large degree. And he viewed it as a positive thing, or at least he tried to sell it as a positive thing, because what he wanted to do was to have Native Americans assimilate into American society. And he felt that by doing that, 
they would have greater opportunity, get jobs, get education, and improve their conditions. Well, that really wasn't happening. What was happening is reservations are being closed down and Native Americans are being moved off of them. And what's happening is they were subject to the same issues of prejudice and discrimination as African Americans or any other minorities, and they were ending up living in urban ghettos. They weren't getting jobs that, that paid well, and they were experiencing Jim Crow and all those things. And really, the termination policy, when you look at it, is a corrupt one. Really what it was about was corporations wanting access to Indian lands that they still thought were valuable, that they could build homes on them or get resources from. And so this was a way for the United States to further take land from Native Americans, something they had been doing since colonial times. So this was not a policy that really was about helping Native Americans. It was a policy about continuing to take resources from them. Uh, now, you can imagine Native Americans begin to protest against this, and the first thing we see is, is in 1961, when JFK is president, is the Declaration of Indian Purpose. And what we see is representatives of 60 different Indian groups. Please understand that within Native American culture, there are several different groups, very distinct groups, and so well, thousands of them. And so what we have is six, representatives of 60 different groups seeking to gain back control of their reservations. Uh, they're trying to create economic opportunities on those reservations. They're trying to create greater control of their lives. And what they're really upset with is there's an organization in Washington, uh, the BIA, known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs, who is uh, not really uh, caring too much about Indian affairs, that is kind of leading the taking over these reservations to benefit white corporations. And so they're very critical of this group and seeking to rebel against it and create greater opportunity, greater control of their own lives. Now, the uh, Indian uh, termination policy will end under later presidents. In 1968, President Johnson forms the National Council on Indian Opportunity, which will have representatives actually caring about Indian affairs from their perspective. And then President Nixon in 1970 will end the termination policy. So that will be done away with. Now before that, there are some things that happen. I need to mention a group here. Uh, the group is known as AIM. Uh, AIM stands for American Indian Movement. That is a militant Native American rights organization. This is a group that kind of models themselves on the Black Panthers. You may remember the Black Panthers formed uh, in response to police brutality. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, AIM forms in 1968, similar to the Black Panthers, largely as a self-defense group against police brutality. Remember, a lot of Native Americans who had been moved off of reservations were finding themselves in urban ghettos as well. Police forces, uh, particularly in this time period, aren't always treating these people rightly. Um, and... Um, being too forceful with them for minor to no offenses at times. And so they're formed against that, modeling the Black Panthers. Um, Native Americans, once again, have been suffering from the highest unemployment, alcoholism, and tuberculosis rate in the country. Um, and so they want to improve their circumstances. Uh, we would we'll seek to improve our circumstances if we were in these situations as well. And AIM will stage uh, several different protests. Let me just mention a couple here. You'll be doing some more reading on these. Uh, but in 1972, uh, AIM will have a march in Washington, D.C., an era of marches in Washington, D.C., right? Uh, a trail, they call this march the Trail of Broken, Broken Treaties. It's a march in D.C. Uh, and during that march, or at the end of that march, 200 Sioux, 200 members of the Sioux tribe, uh, will occupy... Uh, uh, the BIA, uh, the, B the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, for a little while and destroy some of the files and things that are in, that are in there. Uh, in 1973, uh, this is where 200 Sioux, sorry about this, this is where 200 Sioux will take the village of Wounded Knee in 1973 and they'll occupy that town, including hostages. There'll be a shootout with the FBI there in 1973. Now, Hopefully you've heard of Wounded Knee. You should have covered the Battle of Wounded Knee previous years in American history, uh, perhaps in eighth grade, or maybe freshman year. But that is uh, really not a battle. In 1890, uh, U.S. forces slaughtered the entire village of Wounded Knee, killed every Native American in that village, man, woman, and child. 
the elderly just slaughtered them, maybe similar to the My Lai Massacre, which we talked about in Vietnam. And so the, the fact that uh, AIM took over the town of Wounded Knee in 1973 uh, to protest the Bureau of Indian Affairs is symbolic. Okay? Uh, so um, the result of all of these protests is Indians will gain back some control of their own fares, voting rights, and uh, they'll gain back lands on treaties. Uh, later on. So these uh, these uh, protests will be successful and in 1955 uh, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act will pass. Once again with, with this group I'm leaving out some details here because you're going to do a little bit more reading on it. Okay now uh, you're going to have an assignment concerning women's equality as well but I do want to detail this a little bit more because there's quite a bit to it. Uh, so bear with me here, but I want to focus on women's equality for a little bit. Uh, now, with women's equality, we need to define the term feminism. Uh, feminism is the belief that women should have economic, political, and social equality with men. Now, feminism is not a new term. Feminism has been around since at least 1848, perhaps even before that. 1848 is when there was is when the women's suffrage movement officially began. Uh, so feminism has been around. Uh, since then. Now, uh, feminism will be, uh, women's equality will once again be inspired by some of the civil rights gains of this time period. Uh, but what will happen is uh, information coming out will upset women as well. Now, President Kennedy uh, will, have, will appoint a commission on the status of women in 1961. And what that commission will find is that women were seldom promoted and paid far less than men, even, even when doing the same jobs. So what's going on in 1961 is 40% of American women, 40% of American women are working for wages at this point. Uh, jobs were still considered men's and women's work in this time period. And part of the issue is jobs available to women, mostly clerical work, such as domestic service, retail, social work, nursing, teaching, all these jobs pay poorly. And so that's frustrating, uh, particularly if you're if you're a middle class family that's staying together, trying to make ends meet. That can be frustrating, but if you're a single mother, that can definitely be frustrating. And so uh, these women are seeking greater opportunity and equality and pay as well. Uh, they were even given secondary roles in civil rights groups, as noble as many of the civil rights groups were, including uh, groups led by Martin Luther King. They kind of had some of these old traditional roles as well, where men took leadership and women just were like secretaries and stuff. So even civil rights groups could be uh, limiting in the opportunities that they uh, gave women. And so that's frustrating. So they start to take matters into their own hands. And one of the inf inspirations for this is a book. Uh, books can be powerful things. And uh, The Feminine Mystique is a book written by Betty Friedan in 1963. And basically the thesis of this book is the discontent uh, that women were feeling with assigned societal roles. What Betty Friedan argued was, you know, the message in the 50s and, and early 60s to women was, if you want to feel totally fulfilled, be a good mother and be a good housewife. Keep a clean home, make sure dinner's ready, um, all these things. And basically the key to your fulfillment in life, ladies, was to be the best mom and housewife you could be. And what Betty found with herself and with several of her friends and, and those she'd gone to school with, who she contacted for research on this and other areas of research, what she found was that this wasn't the case. That many women who were being told that the key to their happiness is to be a good wife and, and mother uh, is that they weren't happy. And they couldn't figure out why. And they felt guilty about it. And the reality is even those, those roles are very noble and definitely have a sense of fulfillment to them. They're all about others and they're all about uh, making sure you're just serving others all the time. And therefore women and their needs, whether they be intellectual or what have you, were being left out. And so there were a lot of women who wanted more, who wanted to be like their husbands and still be a good parent, but also have a career and all those things. And so The Feminine Mystique was an inspirational book for the women's movement in this respect. 
Now, uh, some groups that formed in this time period uh, now will form in this time period. Now stands for the National Organization for Women, and they will fight for women's equality of opportunity. And that's always the key word. You know, what are these groups fighting for? They're fighting for equality of opportunity. They want to have the same opportunity as other groups. They don't want to just be handed things, but they want their work to bear forth, to bring forth as much opportunity as it does for others. So they just want that equality of opportunity. That's what these groups are fighting for. They're going to focus on some things. They're going to focus on funding for daycare. They're going to focus on equal employment and educational activities, equitable pay. And they're going to focus upon abortion rights. And what will happen is uh, eventually the, the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade in 1973 will state that um, states and governments cannot, li cannot restrict a woman's right to have an abortion within the first three months of the pre pregnancy. Now, of course, this is a very controversial issue when you talk about abortion, uh, passionate arguments on either side of, of the debate, good arguments on either side of the debate. Uh, the one thing that I do want to make sure that is clear about this issue, because um, the propaganda surrounding it can be an error, as propaganda often is, is please be aware that no federal funding goes to abortions. When you hear a politician say that, that is not the case. That is illegal due to the 1977 Hyde Amendment, which President George W. Bush signed into law. So if you ever hear a politician saying, the federal government is paying for abortions, that's not happening. So just be aware that that's not the case. And one of the things we do see with Planned Parenthood is that when it is funded more, abortions actually decrease uh, because of all the other services that Planned Parenthood provides such as access to contraception. And we see when it's defunded, abortions actually increase. And then if, then if abortions are made illegal, it will not stop abortions. Uh, they will still occur because of the lack of access to contraception that occurs through things such as Planned Parenthood. So um, not always a good idea to defund Planned Parenthood either, uh, but that has occurred in recent times. As a matter of fact, abortions actually uh, dropped to the lowest level since Roe v. Wade under the Obama administration when Planned Parenthood uh, was uh, funded at its greatest levels. Uh, other things that the women's equality dealt with is ERA, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, this is a law that was meant to be added to the Constitution where women and men uh, would be subject to the same rights and protections under the law. Uh, what feminists had found was is that there were thousands of laws in the United States that dealt with gender. Uh, laws where you know, the word gender was, you know, females this, males that. And they wanted to strike all those down. They felt the law should be blind according to gender, at least when it comes to opportunity. Uh, and they felt that the best way to do that was to get an amendment in the Constitution. And this amendment, for the most part, was smoothly sailing. Uh, it was passed by Congress in 1972, but as you should know by now, when an amendment passes Congress, that doesn't mean it's in the Constitution. It still has to be ratified, and that will not occur. Not every state will approve the amendment. To ratify is to have states approve an amendment. Um, when you have 50 states, you need 38 states to approve an amendment, and what will happen by 1972 is 35 states will and three will not, and the needed three more will not. And so that amendment has still not been ratified in the Constitution, although I believe, and don't quote me on this, I believe Virginia did recently ratify it. So there may only be down to two left who need to ratify this amendment. So maybe someday it'll be in the Constitution. Uh, you're going to do an assignment that looks at the Equal Rights Amendment uh, uh, in a few days. Uh, okay, so now women's equality didn't just give up when the Equal Rights Amendment was a past, right? What you see is women's organizations begin to focus on electing women to public office, and they'll be pretty successful at this. Um, currently, there are 96 women in the House of Representatives and 22 in the Senate. In 1984, we had our first woman on a presidential ticket. This is Geraldine Ferraro, Ferraro uh, who was Walter Mondale's vice presidential candidate in 1984. Uh, Mondale and Ferraro will lose that election to Reagan, actually in a landslide. Reagan will win that election by a large margin. But pretty significant that in 1984 you had your first woman vice presidential nominee. Uh, and since then we've had uh, women uh, go on uh, to serve in greater roles. We've had women appointed to the Supreme Court. 
Um, Madeleine Albright has been Secretary of State. Hillary Clinton has been Secretary of State. And of course, in 2016, Hillary Clinton ran for the presidency. Um, so women have made great gains. Uh, there are still some things to overcome, which I'll try to mention here. Uh, so let's see. So what has been accomplished? What we've seen is, is improvements in pay equity. So what we've seen is acts, and you may read about some of these. What we've seen is acts put into place that have tried to enforce pay equity, where jobs are based on, or job pay is based on education level and skill rather than separate gender pay scales. It used to be quite normal for companies and corporations to have separate scales, right? If you're a woman, you get this much. If you're a man, you get this much. Can't do that anymore, at least officially. There's still companies who try to get away with it, but that's illegal. Uh, maternity leave has come about. You know, women can keep their job when they're pregnant. They can have some time at home with the child for a little while before they come back to work. Uh, corporate benefit packages have improved uh, toward women. Uh, there was daycare funding, but that will be cut by the Reagan administration, so we don't see as much daycare funding, which is problematic uh, for women who are um, you know, working class. Uh, we could really use that funding so they can go to work and support their family. Uh, but we have seen gains that have occurred. What's interesting is in recent years is we've seen more and more women in managerial positions, you know, managing things like McDonald's or um, even uh, uh, hospital management positions, things like that. So that's been pretty neat to see those increases, increases in professional special area jobs. With increases in education and access to degrees, uh, this is kind of a natural thing that's occurred for many women. Um, there are still things to overcome. Unequal pay and unequal representation remain. I mean, you can make an argument that there should still be a lot more women in government than what there are. Uh, there are still pay issues. Uh, um, and what we see is women working outside of the home make up half of the nation's workforce. And what we see is female heads of households still have high poverty percentages. And that's particularly high among average American women. And this is a stat that just doesn't seem to want to go away. And there are several different reasons for it. Um, some of it is just perhaps experience. Some women who haven't, don't have as many years as men uh, as part of that. But it, it, studies seem to indicate that it's more difficult for women to get promotions. Uh, there are, um, out of the 500 heads of major corporations or CEOs in the United States, 10 of them are women, so you can argue that there should be more of that, things like that. So things have improved. Um, but more difficult for women to get promoted, and there's still issues with pay that remain. Okay, one more group to focus upon, and a couple closing comments, and I'll finally be done with this lecture. Uh, another group that will be inspired by, arguably, by the uh, African American Civil Rights Movement is uh, LGBT rights movement. Um, and what we see with this group is an unfortunate consequence is uh, is that they had been banned from government jobs or military service through much of the nation's history. Indeed, one way in which you could get out of the Vietnam draft or out of the Vietnam War is just lie about your sexuality. If you were a guy and you weren't gay, you could go in and say you were. And that automatically got you out of military service, although we do know that homosexual males and these day females have served in the United States military, and many of them with great distinction, uh, this was something that the military was against for a very, very long time. Now, the event that inspires um, the uh, LGBT movement is the 1969 Stonewall, ri Stonewall riots. This is sometimes seen as uh, the um, uh, beginning of the movement, kind of the event that began it. And what happened is uh, Stonewall is a, it's a club uh, in, in Greenwich Village, part of New York City. And it's, it's a gay club where, where gays could go and basically be themselves. And the police would har harass it quite frequently. And one time they harassed it and things got out of control and there was a few days of rioting. And um, the reaction to this and the, um, the violence associated with it, the repression associated with it, will kind of be the um, start to the um, civil rights or the LGBT uh, aspect of the civil rights movement, kind of seen as that anyway. Um, now, and we will see gains. And uh, once again, this is something that, you know, we could detail. This, this deserves its own separate lecture. Unfortunately, we're not meeting every day, so this is frustrating. Uh, 
But we do see gains in the LGBT rights movement since 1969 with the Stonewall incident. Uh, by the 1990s, several states outlaw anti-gay discrimination. The military made somewhat of an improvement in 1994 with a don't ask, don't tell policy. By 1994, they're no longer asking uh, an enlistee if they are gay or not. And that person no longer had to tell. Now, some had served before that and just you know lied about it because they had a passion to serve. Um, so uh, during the Bill Clinton presidency, we'll have don't ask, don't tell, so you can enlist and you won't be asked your sexuality, which had been happening up to that point. And then in 2011, uh, when President Obama is president, uh, this will be totally repealed. So now this doesn't occur. Uh, your sexuality is, is not an issue when you go to enlist. You just enlist, and if you have the desire to serve, you have that opportunity, which is the way it should be, I would argue, in a democracy. And then a great gain for the LGBT rights movement in June 26, 2015, uh, the Supreme Court legalizes same-sex marriage. Unfortunately, there have been some negative reactions to that, uh, but this is seen as a, a great thing for these people who just, wanna, just want to um, do what any other American would like to do, and that is be committed to someone they love and uh, be open about it and receive the benefits of uh, that a married couple gets uh, tax-wise and so forth uh, through this decision. Okay, let me close by going back in time for a moment. Uh, I'm going to go back to 1968 uh, because that'll set us up for the next lecture and some material that you'll be reading about. And this is actually a repeat. This is a review. You may remember that 1968 was a very tumultuous year in United States history. The Democratic Party was very divided. Lyndon Johnson decides not to run for re-election in 1968. There is a riot at the Democratic National Convention when uh, the um, Hubert Humphrey is chosen over the peace candidate of Eugene McCarthy. Um, as anti-war activists were beaten and gassed by Chicago police outside that convention. Earlier that year, Bobby Kennedy, who probably would have been the next president of the United States, had been assassinated. Uh, the Tet Offensive occurs in 1968, and Martin Luther King Jr. is also assassinated in 1968, which leads to hundreds of riots across the country. So a uh, tumultuous year in United States history. And what this leads to is the nomination of Richard Nixon, and he will be elected, uh, the first Republican president since Eisenhower. And the reason why he's elected is he is promising a return to law and order. Um, and, what, and he's also promising to end the war in Vietnam. And so what we're seeing is, is a conservative reaction to some of the um, tumult, some of the upsetness of the counterculture era or the Vietnam War era. Uh, people wanted things to settle down. And Richard Nixon is promising to do that. And people are also concerned that perhaps traditional American values, whatever those are, are under attack. And so Richard Nixon is seen as the man who can help reinstill traditional American values in the Vietnam War and promise a return to law and order. And it can surely be debated whether or not he ever did so. And we will deal with that in a later lecture. As always, thank you for your attention.